Naomi, Professor Allen, please let us have some facts and figures about the UK Biobank. So UK Biobank was set up between 2006 and 2010 and we recruited half a million men and women uh, from the general population around the UK aged between 14 and 69 to join our research study. So what all data are you generating in this context? So when participants joined the study, they came along to an assessment centre and we asked them a whole range of questions about their lifestyle, medical history. We collected data from physical measures, blood pressure, um, weight, height, lung function and so on. Um, and we also collected biological samples that we're turning into data. So we're using the biological samples to generate genetic data about all of these individuals, to generate biomarker data on all of these individuals. Um, and all together, we have about 20 to 30,000 different data points. So they're a highly well characterized population. What are the purposes people will put this to use for? So the UK Biobank resource was set up to enable public health research that's in the broad public interest. So it has a really wide remit for public health. So researchers are, for example, looking at how genetic factors influence heart disease and depression, how lifestyle and environmental factors like air pollution um, influence cancer. They're looking at how cognitive function changes as we get older. Um, you name it, people are looking at it. And because we are linking all of our participants to their electronic medical records, we have information on a wide range of health outcomes. So we're not limited just to cancer or just heart disease. We can measure everything in all half a million people. So how has this data been generated? Is this structured data? It's all structured data. So everything is coded um, in tabular form, although we do have, um, for example, we have MRI scans on 100,000 people. So these are image scans and also eye image scans we have that we're releasing the raw scans to, to researchers and researchers are then deriving um, phenotypes from them. So for example from the brain scan um, there are analytical pipelines set it in place that can derive up to 3,000 different metrics on your brain ranging from brain volume, head size to the structure and neural connections in your brain all of which is coded data. So you can go from uncoded pictures from an MRI scan to coded data that scientists can use to understand what causes disease. You've mentioned that research community. Who all can access this so, data? So all bona fide researchers, so that's researchers who are at a research institute, but they can be from the academic world or from the commercial sector, can access the resource. And it's not just researchers from the UK, it's from researchers worldwide. And in fact, two thirds of, of 12,000 of our registered researchers are now from uh, overseas. So we have many investigators from Europe, from the US, from China, from Australia, and, and so on. Um, and they're accessing the data to do public health research, epidemiology, genetics, prediction, health economics, a whole right range of research that's in the public interest, but they are from all over the world. And what do they have to deliver, those researchers out there? So, um, in return for access to the data, researchers are asked to make their um, findings in the public domain. So that's usually a peer-reviewed publication, but it can be um, a website portal. So, for example, some research groups who have done genome-wide association scans on, on all of the traits in UK Biobank, you can't publish that in a journal. It's just too much data, too many results. So they're making them available via research platforms and portals. Um, what we do ask is researchers return those results back to us so that we can incorporate them into the, res into the resource and they can be shared by others. What about future perspectives? What types of new additional data are you going to generate? 
So that's a, that's a really good question. And um, so in addition to the genetic data that we're currently focusing on, so that's the exome sequencing plus full whole genome sequencing data, we would also really like to collect data about circulating metabolites in the bloodstream and um, circulating proteins in the bloodstream because we think that will give a really good indication of the mechanisms through which lifestyle and your genetics influences disease risk by measuring how metabolites and proteins change in relation to disease and health. So that's our that's our kind of next focus, if you like, over the next coming years. But at the moment, we're focusing on the genomics and also on the imaging because we think by having a large range of imaging scans, that will help researchers to understand the pathways through which genetics and lifestyle influence disease. So what types of patient consent are you basing all this on? Is it broad consent? So we have um, individual written consent from all participants to for their data to be used in perpetuity, so even after their death, for health research that's deemed to be in the public interest. So it's a very broad consent. Um, and we also have consent to link to their health-related medical records. Um, so, and because we have such broad, explicit written consent, um, we are able to link to electronic medical records, we, we're able to do all of these assays, and we're able to make this data available to researchers worldwide because of that explicit consent that we have.